So recently, Vox, that's the American media organization that promises to explain the news to you, they call it explanatory journalism, sent this young lad, Johnny Harris, to Haiti to find out why Haitians are so poor whilst their neighbors, the Dominicans, are relatively well off. This is all part of Vox's big budget series, Borders, a show that's already enjoyed its second season. Now, if you don't know, these two nations, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, share the same resource-rich island of Hispaniola. So why the disparity in wealth? This is what Vox journalist Johnny Harris seeks to find out. I came here to find out how the two countries that share this one island can be so different. With a politically volatile and impoverished Haiti on one side, and the stable and relatively rich Dominican Republic on the other. How did this line produce two totally different worlds? This entire premise, the assumptions made in his opening questions, speak to the false narrative he's about to weave. To assess and compare the wealth of two nations, you should be considering things like the relative economic liberty of citizens, the relative skill set of the labor force, the technology available to entrepreneurs, comparative political stability in each country, local business ethics and practices, crime, infrastructure, culture, and so on. But Johnny really doesn't investigate any of these things and instead immediately suggests it's the division between these people that causes the wealth gap. It must be the border. The show is called Borders, so maybe he has to go for that angle. But still, whilst trade and borders are not irrelevant in a wealth calculation, Johnny is omitting a hell of a lot of important factors and he's deliberately limiting the scope of this investigation. My journey starts here at this beach village in southern Haiti, where Haitian merchants, most of them women, are preparing for a nighttime boat ride. The women boarding this boat have one goal, to make it to the border where they will be let into a Dominican market to buy and sell goods before returning to their villages. Why don't they just open a market in Haiti? We will never get an answer to this question in this fantastic piece of journalism. It's international trade at its most informal. We're taking these boats because the next door mountain range makes the land journey almost impossible. Why don't they just build a road? These worn out wooden boats have been making this exact journey twice per week for decades. And yet the process remains chaotic and unorganized as if it's happening for the first time. Why is this process still chaotic? All of this energy, time and effort all to transport a handful of goods that in most countries would be shipped in bulk inside one of these. We make this seven hour journey to the border town, arriving around 4 a.m. The sun rises and we walk to the border market. This market was established right on the border as a partnership between the two nations to give vendors from both sides a place to buy and sell on equal footing. As we approach the border, I quickly realize that's not what's happening here. So I'm looking across the border right now into the market and you can see that Dominicans are already setting up. This is one of the big complaints of the Haitians. They're stuck on this side waiting to cross the border and the border guards are just delaying it. And meanwhile, the Dominicans are able to set up and get the best spots. These Haitians come from miles away on this grueling boat journey that I know now firsthand is very grueling, and they get to the border and the guards stop them for no reason. I'm supposed to open it up for everyone at the same time. The guards keep the Haitian women from crossing, not letting anyone know how long it will be. The tension grows, and then finally, hours after the Dominicans were allowed to enter, the guards open up the bridge. They buy and sell for the day before returning to the boats to make the journey home. The grueling boat journey, the senseless discrimination, it embodies the asymmetry that exists on this island. Watching it happen, it's impossible not to ask how it got like this. So we can see that there's this attempt to portray Haitians as innocent victims of Dominican intolerance. There's no attempt to find out why the Dominicans treat them like this. Why the animosity for Haitians from Dominicans? Where does it come from? Doesn't it take two to tango? Shall we get the Dominican perspective on this? No, because Vox is spinning a narrative, so these questions are never asked. Which of course encourages the viewer to likewise not ask these questions. Instead, you're just supposed to believe that the Dominicans are behaving out of prejudice, senseless discrimination, as Johnny Harris puts it. This is actually completely untrue, and the Dominicans have good reasons for their behavior, but we'll come back to this later. There are a few key things that explain how this island produced two very different countries, but if you want to get at the very root of it, you have to go back to when this island was owned by two European 
powers, France and Spain. This island is actually the first place that Christopher Columbus set up a colony in the New World on his first voyage back in like 1490s. France wanted a piece of this island because it was rich in resources like sugar and coffee. So they fought a war with the Spanish and they ended up splitting the island in two. One side would be the Spanish colony of Santo Domingo and the other side would be the French colony with the same name, Saint-Domingue, just in French. And that is the most important part of understanding this whole thing, is how these imperial powers treated their colonial possessions. The French exploited the land. They brought in tons of slaves and they were interested in making Saint-Domingue solely an economic producer. They destroyed the soil from aggressively harvesting the same crop year after year. And they created a group of very resentful, overworked, and abused slaves that eventually rebelled. The Spanish had a different approach. After establishing domination on this island by massacring the indigenous population, they didn't exploit it like the French did. Instead, they went to places like Mexico and Peru to look for gold. So they didn't bring nearly as many slaves onto this island, and as a result, they weren't nearly as profitable a colony. Instead, the Spanish integrated with the remaining indigenous population by recognizing the native leader's authority and intermarrying with the locals. The result was a smaller and more racially mixed population with a sustainable economy and a political system, something totally absent from France's colony. This becomes really important in the early 1800s when independence comes around. Haiti declares independence, fights off the French, and basically declares itself the first black former slave republic in the world. They do so with very little framework for a society and for a government. And they also do so with land that has been exploited year after year with the same crop, which basically destroys the fertility of the land. And to add to all of that, because they were this first black republic, the world essentially isolated them. The United States didn't want to recognize the independence of a black nation. They thought it might become a slave empire and seek revenge. Suffocating embargoes and the independence debt, as well as the lack of any tradition or investment in governmental institutions, guaranteed Haiti's failure from the moment it was born. And a racist world made sure of it. All right, let's correct some errors and dig into some of this tripe. First, the idea that Haiti was left without a legal or political system that's just not true. You're correct, Johnny, that the slaves revolted and became the government, but in becoming independent, they kept French laws. Haiti inherited the five classic Napoleonic codes, among them the Penal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code. Following independence, Haiti did not opt for the creation of new laws, but retained French law, and French as the official language used in legislation and the administration of justice. So compared to other civilizations that had to develop their own legal and political systems from scratch, the Haitians inherited some of the best in the world, an opportunity they've squandered by routinely allowing incompetent, corrupt, self-serving demagogues and dictators to take power, and by demonstrating complete legislative and administrative incompetence. Primitive rhythms and the ancient cult of voodoo are the heartbeat and lifeblood of the people who live in one of the world's most miserable countries. This is Haiti, a land of idol worship and of Papa Doc Duvalier. Together they ruined this once lovely, once prosperous country which sits on one end of the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. Nature endowed this place with fertility and natural beauty. It was left to the greed and ignorance of men to ruin it. Haiti's downward progress from flourishing French colony to become the world's poorest state reached its lowest point under the 14-year dictatorship of Francois Duvalier, which ended with his death in April. Duvalier's legacy to Haiti is poverty, ignorance, disease, and misery. Haiti used to have a functional, state-of-the-art, world-renowned legal system, but today, well, here are four quick points for you. Haiti's criminal laws have been supplemented over the last 150 years by a series of laws and decrees that are unknown to many of the legal community, and not all legal actors have copies of the laws. So cops, lawyers, even judges, they don't know what the laws are, 
and there's no way to look them up. Uncertainty abounds because the penal and procedural codes have significant gaps and internal inconsistencies. These gaps, particularly in areas like arrest and detention, grant broad discretion to the police and other justice actors, which leads to abuse and enables rampant corruption. Human rights don't really apply in Haiti because their criminal laws predate the development of international human rights instruments, and therefore they do not contain these fundamental guarantees. Just one side effect of this, a booming industry in child slavery. Haiti's laws, being so old, do not address modern crimes, such as organized crime, corruption-related offenses, trafficking in persons, children and body parts, cybercrime, terrorist-related offenses, acts of torture, and crimes against children such as neglect and child pornography. Worse, Modern-day methods for investigating crimes, like the use of surveillance or taking DNA samples, aren't covered by Haitian law, since these methods didn't exist at the time of drafting. Also not provided for in Haitian laws is the protection of victims and witnesses, and because of the absence of witness protection and other investigative measures in Haitian laws, the tools that the investigating authority can employ to combat impunity for serious crimes is severely limited. <laughs> He says the police grabbed him as he was walking through a market, but he has no idea what the charge is. The 2010 earthquake sparked a mass prison break. Jean escaped along with the other prisoners, but was later rearrested. <laughs> So you get the point. They used to have decent laws that worked well for the times, a great foundation to build on, just one of the many advantages they inherited from the French colony. But as they updated their laws, they got everything wrong, and now they're a joke and no sane person would want to do business there, which is a big part of the reason why they're so poor. Oh, and you know what else they inherited? Slavery. Yes, they continued forced labor for decades after the French left, even though their own constitution prohibited it. Secondly, your point about intermarriage is very interesting. You suggest, Johnny, that the Dominican Republic was advantaged by the Spanish marrying the locals, something I'll come back to. But the first thing to comment on here is that in making this point, you inadvertently give away the game. You reveal why the DR is richer than Haiti. The Dominicans are Latino, and so their economy and standard of living reflects other Latino nations. Whilst the Haitians are descended from sub Saharan slaves from the west coast of Africa, and so their economy and standard of living reflects other sub-Saharan African nations. Haiti has more in common with Senegal or Sierra Leone, whilst the DR has more in common with any of these nations. So yes, you are correct, Johnny. These two populations are not at all similar linguistically, culturally, historically, or genetically. It's a shame you fail to recognize the significance of this. Third, let's talk about the indigenous population, the Tainos, the folks who occupied Hispaniola when the Spanish arrived in 1492. They were seafaring American Indians, indigenous tribes from the lower North and upper South America, who'd sailed from South America and settled on Caribbean islands, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and so on. Johnny says the Spanish massacred them, but then following this, they treated them well, integrating with them, marrying them, and a mixed race, multicultural utopia was born. Look how peaceful they look, but there's a lot wrong with this interpretation. So what happened to the Taino people on Hispaniola? Within 30 years of first contact with European man, between 80 to 90% of them had died. This happened for a few reasons, disease being the overwhelming cause of their population decline. The Taino had no resistance to old world infectious diseases, smallpox, influenza and measles. Hundreds of thousands died. Mothers seeing their children afflicted by disease would murder them and then take their own lives. This is how desperate they became. Still, the Tainos wanted to trade with the Spanish, but the Spanish set to colonization, seeking to rule and teach these people, and thus conflict with the Spanish demanding the Tainos adopt their practices, their techniques, and do this kind of work, and that, and so on, and the Tainos resisting. 
they fought back and lost. And yes, many of these battles resulted in massacres. The Spanish knew how to fight and had better weapons. Some of the Taino were also enslaved and some were paid to work down dangerous mines. A combination of exhaustion and labor-related accidents took many more lives. And on top of that, the arrival of the Spanish had increased the number of people on the island. And so there was increased food demand and the Taino refused to cooperate and would not farm according to European methods. And so, from 1495 to 1496, a famine occurred that claimed another 50,000 Taino lives. It's near impossible to know how many Taino lived on Hispaniola when the Spanish colonialists arrived, but certainly hundreds of thousands perished. But then, says Johnny, after enslavement, forced labor, warfare, famine and disease killed most of their population, the Spanish integrated with them and intermarried and everything was okay. And yet, it is this process that finally finished them off. Census records from 1514 reveal that over 40% of Spanish men on the island of Hispaniola had Taino wives. And by the early 16th century, Spanish documents declared the Taino extinct. Is this not the worst possible outcome of being colonized? To be genetically replaced? To have your ethnic identity, your culture, language and religion bred out of existence? The Tainos lost their land, their birthright, their autonomy, their nation. Yet to Johnny's progressive brain, this is progress because race mixing is good, I guess? Certainly, we're led to believe that the Dominicans had it easier than the Haitians. The Haitians were slaves, the French were worse than the Spanish. But what of the outcomes of these two groups? Today, the Haitians exist and the Tainos don't. Their ethnic identity has vanished from this earth. No one identifies as Taino anymore. And what language do the Dominicans speak? They speak Spanish. They have 50% plus European ancestry. The Spanish didn't integrate with them, they dominated them. And intermarriage ensured the the extinction of the Tainos as a people. Fourth, and it is extraordinary that Johnny omits this, once the Europeans left, the Haitians invaded the Dominican Republic in 1822 and established a military dictatorship. The Haitians subjugated the Dominicans, banned their native language, and made it illegal for them to practice their traditions and customs. They tried to exterminate Dominican culture, and they might have succeeded had the Dominicans not fought for and successfully earned their independence in 1844. Why didn't you include this, Johnny? I guess the fact that Haitians are oppressed Dominicans doesn't really fit into your narrative of relative Haitian victimhood, so you just left it out of your short film. Yeah, real honest reporting there, pal. And finally, the fifth glaring error. Another lie by omission, and this time it's the point he makes about trade. Because they were this first black republic, the world essentially isolated them. The United States didn't want to recognize the independence of a black nation. They thought it might become a slave empire and seek revenge. Yeah, America recognized Haiti as an independent state in 1862, and it's been trading with the nation for over 150 years. Today, Haiti enjoys tariff-free access to the US economy for many of its exports. So according to you, Johnny, they're poor because America didn't trade with them for 60 years, but that 150 years of trade, much of it tariff-free, isn't a factor worth considering? Today, America not only trades with Haiti, but it now injects millions, sometimes even billions worth of dollars of aid into the nation every year. But I guess you have to leave this out because it doesn't really support your the Haitians are victims of white racism thesis, right Johnny? For blatant misrepresentations and the rewriting of history aside, this explanation, the very root of it, as Johnny says, this attempt to blame today's impoverishment in Haiti on what the French did in the 1700s, it's desperate, to say the least. Loads of countries have been through much worse than Haiti and more recently. Take Germany, for instance. In the last 100 years, they've lost two world wars and have seen their nation completely destroyed. Their country has been split up and divided by foreign powers on two separate occasions. After World War II, Eastern Germans were ethnically cleansed right across the European continent, and half the country and around half the German population within Germany were effectively imprisoned, shot if they tried to flee, subjected to the oppression of Soviet rule and the destitution of communism for over 40 years, and yet today, it has a highly developed social market economy, the largest national economy in Europe, and the fourth largest by nominal GDP in the world. How come the Germans could do this, but the Haitians can't? And would it make any sense to look at a current socioeconomic problem in Germany, say the increase in child poverty, and blame it on the Soviets? Let's just use your reasoning, Johnny. Would it make any sense to look at this issue and say, well, the Berlin Wall only came down in 1989, they were really put at a disadvantage, or, well, they were bombed a lot during World War II. I mean, 
you'd be rightfully mocked if you made such a connection. There is no correlation between the suffering and oppression of the German people in the past and the child poverty rate within the country today. None. And yet with Haiti, economic failure in 2018 is blamed on colonization of the 1700s. The fact they can't organize a system for boat journeys, or build a road through a mountain, or run functional markets in their own country. This inability to function is explained away as a result of French rule. Well, they've only been independent for 200 years, and the US have only been trading with them for 150 years. Their soil used to be over farmed, it's not their fault. Yeah, this is absurd. And here's another interesting tidbit before we move on. In the mid 20th century, the economies of the two countries, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, were comparable. Since that time, the Dominican economy has grown, whilst the Haitian economy has diminished. These places were on equal footing, and the disparity of wealth has only emerged more recently. So to explain why one is relatively well off while the other extremely poor, it makes very little sense to go all the way back to the 1700s, don't you think? So shut up about colonization. It's a lousy excuse. There is no correlation. That racism isn't just embedded into Haiti's history. It is in fact very alive today. As I drive up the border, by coincidence my driver is also a Dominican border patrol official. We have hours in the car where he slowly and cautiously tells me about how immigration policy has changed in the Dominican Republic in recent years. <laughs> saber dónde están los haitianos que están en República Dominicana, saber dónde están uh -huh. y saber cuántos son y qué, qué sitio están cada uno. Ahí nace el, el programa de regularización. Regularization program. That's a euphemism. He's talking about a policy of targeting anyone of Haitian descent, even citizens, rounding them up and deporting them. The Dominican constitution that was drafted in 1929 says that anyone born in the country is automatically a citizen, even if your parents were undocumented immigrants. This is the same in places like the United States. But the DR rewrote its constitution in 2010 to only give citizenship to those born on DR soil to legal residents. Then, in 2013, the High Court in the DR ruled that this new definition would be applied retroactively all the way back to 1929, meaning any citizen who had been born in the DR to undocumented parents would have their citizenship revoked. More than 200,000 Dominican citizens were suddenly stateless. Dominican law said that if these stateless people wanted to stay in the DR, they would have to go to a government office and put their name on this foreigner registry. The government gave these people one year to either get their name on the registry or face deportation. Over 55,000 have been officially deported since the June 2015 deadline. The UN estimates that 128,000 people have voluntarily fled to Haiti, a country many of them have never lived in. Some came here to this camp on the border where they've been living in limbo for years. <laughs> Having 200,000 people being able to vote in an election could change an outcome. They're going to bet, I'm going to take a chance, I'm serious. Oh, they're going to have to do it again. I'm 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 going to have to do it again. You know, for people who've never lived in Haiti and for folks who've apparently been born in the Dominican Republic, it is pretty curious that none of them are speaking Spanish and Creole appears to be their native tongue. I mean, why is that? If they're integrated Dominicans, wouldn't they be speaking Spanish? I don't know that you're lying. I'm just saying, yeah, I'm saying you're lying, Johnny. I'm saying you're, you're misrepresenting who these people are. The moment I cross into the DR, I start to see what this crackdown looks like. On a 75 kilometer bus ride, we pass eight security checkpoints in which security personnel board the bus to eye who is on it and in some cases check papers. But each time we stop, they seem to only check the papers of the same few passengers. We just checked the passports of the three darkest dudes on the bus. Me and the two guys in front of me were the darkest guys on this bus. 
and you. That's my translator, Pascal. He's an American citizen, but everywhere we go in the DR, security forces keep asking him for his passport. Halfway through the journey, we pull off the road into a facility where a few young military guys are sitting around, and our driver brings this woman and her two children over to the military guys. She's speaking in perfect Dominican Spanish to them, claiming that her children are Dominican and that the driver brought us to this checkpoint to turn her in because she's black. None of this seems to matter. She doesn't have her papers, and her skin color seems to be all the guards need to see. Haiti's land and people were abused when it was a colony of slaves. The world then shunned it with embargoes and independence debts when it was a new nation. And today, Haitians in the DR experience racism that is overt enough to be enshrined in law. Okay, so according to Vox, Haiti is a shithole for three reasons. First, France exploited them and ruined their land by overfarming during the colonization of the 1700s. Second, following independence, the entire world, which is racist by the way, shunned Haiti and refused to trade with her. And third, it's the Dominican Republic's fault, those racists. This explanation is clearly lacking. If I were to make a pie chart explaining Haitian poverty, none of these supposed factors would feature. So it must be the environment, right? The environment's making them poor, because it obviously isn't the people, that'd be racist. But there's a huge problem here, because Haiti has an ideal environment for wealth generation. They've got a mild climate, you can farm all year round. Yes, they have some storms, but generally it's beaut. They've got fertile soil, the French overfarming was long ago and is no longer a factor, and indeed, one university student, Alex Tupper, an agricultural business senior, went to Haiti, established a farm, and manages to produce 11,000 meals a month. The land is rich in minerals, if only they bothered to get them out of the ground. It's absolutely stunning, i.e. perfect for a booming tourism trade. The seas are full of expensive seafood, which could become a prosperous export industry. Plus, it's one of the gateway islands to the Americas. It's perfectly located for thriving trade, for hosting ships and getting all those sailors and cruise passengers to spend, spend, spend. So given all of this, there's really no reason for Haiti to be poor at all. Johnny Harris has, either deliberately or because he's so ideologically possessed by egalitarian fantasies that his brain just isn't able to go there, missed the most important factor. It's the people, the human capital of the country. In comparing the Dominican Republic to Haiti and wondering why the wealth gap, simply compare the average IQ of the two nations. The Dominican Republic is at 82, and Haiti has an average of 67. And right there, we've pretty much answered our question. Richard Lynn, a British professor of psychology, and Tatu Van Hannen, a Finnish professor of political science, conducted IQ studies in more than 80 countries, and they both argue that differences in national income are highly correlated with differences in the average national intelligence quotient. The average IQ of a nation is incredibly closely related to that nation's wealth. And why do they have different average IQs? Because the Dominicans are a mix of Spanish and South American, the genetic makeup of the population is approximately 60% European, whereas the Haitians are 95% Afro-Haitian, descended from sub-Saharan Africans from the east of the continent. If we look at a global map of average IQ, it's pretty obvious that the people in Haiti come from the red areas of Africa, and people in the DR come from Europe and South America. They're of different stock, and one of them got more European 
European admixture. It really is that simple, folks. And these biological differences between the two populations lead to dramatic differences in social and economic outcomes. So let's look at the Dominican Republic first. It's got a small population of around 10 million people, and it has a GDP of $71.5 billion and a growing economy. It's a relatively prosperous place. It's not rolling in it, but it's getting by. The average life expectancy is 73.6 years, the literacy rate is a fair 92%, and the nation can boast both political and economic stability. Yes, crime rates are a problem, yes, corruption is commonplace, but it's still a safe destination for tourists, and most people enjoy a secure lifestyle. This is a country that's basically making a success of it. People are hardworking and they're making the most of their resource-rich land and favorable environment. But compare that to Haiti, with a population almost identical to the DRs at 10 million and an almost identical setup in terms of resources, location, and so on. The GDP is just over $8 billion. Violent crime is rampant and sexual violence a common phenomenon. The country is incredibly corrupt, it lacks proper infrastructure, and just 61% are literate. Less than 3% of Haitians finish primary school and it has one of the lowest per capita incomes on earth, endemic drug problems, high infant mortality, primitive healthcare, and its dominant religion is voodoo. Haiti is one of the most dangerous, superstitious, backward nations on earth. And this is nothing new. At the beginning of the 20th century, a British member of the Royal Geographic Society, Hesketh Pritchard, traveled to Haiti on a fact-finding mission to see how the country was faring a hundred years into its independence. He wanted to see if the Haitians, given all the advantages in the world, could govern themselves to address the HQ, as it were. This is what he wrote. The present condition of Haiti gives the best possible answer to the question, and considering the experiment has lasted for a century, perhaps also a conclusive one. For a century, the answer has been working itself out there in flesh and blood. The Negro has had his chance, a fair field and no favor. He has had the most beautiful and fertile of the Caribbees for his own. He has had the advantage of excellent French laws. He inherited a made country with Cap Haitien for its Paris. And here was a wide land, sown with prosperity, a land of wood, water, towns and plantations, and in the midst of it, the black man was turned loose to work out his own salvation. What has he made of the chances that were given to him? At the end of a hundred years of trial, how does the black man govern himself? What progress has he made? Absolutely none. Loving the chicken. Lalo? Yeah. No, no, that's a crazy event. Oh, you did that with Lalo? Not, not loving it. Then everybody knows that's you're not Asian. Question. How's business for her? Right? Can you ask her? Not with, not really good this time. Not good. No. I mean, the country situation. People don't have any income, right. any money, so they can't buy food in the street. So we can imagine that. That's, the, that's why you see a lot of guys here begging, you know, can you buy me some food? Can you give me something? When you make television anywhere, people stop and stare. Crowds form. Usually, they're just curious. Here, we notice the kids, gathering just outside the view of our lenses. Not looking at me or the cameras, but looking at what we're eating. One plate of food would be a good day for any of them. And here, I'm painfully aware, I'm eating three. I mean, the day is almost over and she got a bunch of rice. Right. And then all those people around here, they are sitting here waiting for just a piece. What would you do? Hungry kids and a hard-working businesswoman. A brief conference with producers and I think, in this case, easy to make the situation better, right? We decide we'll buy the lady out pay full price for every order of food she can muster, and we'll feed them. Simple. Fill the bellies of some cute kids, a good-hearted expression of kindness. We all go back to our hotel feeling really good about ourselves, right? What happens is both predictable and a metaphor for what's wrong with so much well-intentioned aid effort around the world.
We are now 200 years into this experiment, and Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Two out of three Haitians live on less than $2 a day. The beautiful towns they inherited from the French have degenerated into crime, disease, and trash-ridden slums. They used to have rich, thick forests, but the locals destroyed them to use them as firewood. So today, only 2% of the country is forested, and food is so scarce the people must resort to eating mud and clay cookies to fill their bellies. Even before the 2010 earthquake, Haiti suffered from heavy burdens of hunger and malnutrition. 40% of households were undernourished, and 30% of children suffered from chronic malnutrition. The land is fertile, the climate perfect to build a thriving agricultural economy. Coffee, sugar, rice, sweet potatoes, bananas, and a whole host of fruit and veg can be grown here. But they starve, seemingly unable to sustain a farm. 90% of farmers depend on rain for their harvest, and only 10% of the crops are irrigated. Agriculture is the most important sector of Haiti's economy, but failing to produce enough food, they import more than 50% for their nation's needs. 100,000 children under five years of age suffer from acute malnutrition, while one in three children is stunted or irreversibly short for their age. Less than 50% of households have access to safe water, and only 25% benefit from adequate sanitation and one-third of Haitian women and children are anemic. One volunteer account reads, I visited once on a cut mission trip. We tried to plant a bunch of stuff, but each new year of students going would come back to barren fields covered in salt and oil and people eating dirt. They don't leave stuff alone. They don't buy fertilizer. They don't water it. They don't get rid of bugs. They are literally incapable of farming without constant supervision. Despite going there, paying for the investment of supplies and doing the initial work for them, they could not leave it alone, ever. My school stopped doing trips there because it wasn't making any progress after eight years. They never brought in a harvest and instead continually destroyed the land we prepared. They salt and sugar and oil their own farmland. By the end of our trips, they had created the only barren area in view. Everything else is lush plants everywhere, quietly. We all kind of reached the same conclusion, helping them is a waste. Now, of course, some people will question the validity of this account, it being anonymous and all, but it comports entirely with the reality on the ground and expresses the crux of the issue. The Haitian people have an average IQ below what is required for a population to sustain itself. Without the ability to farm, they are unable to ensure food security. And food security is the basic prerequisite for a functioning society. As Kevin McDonald puts it, Haiti is the quintessential dysfunctional society, a nation on welfare, a republic of NGOs, where half the budget comes from foreign aid, and 3,000 non-governmental organizations operate most government services, including education and healthcare. Over 50% of the Haitian population have an IQ of 70 or below. To put that in perspective, a person with an IQ of 80 will be denied entry to the armed forces, deemed a security risk and untrainable. A person with an IQ of 75 will require constant supervision at work and can only perform the most basic of menial tasks. A person with an IQ of 70 is classified as intellectual disabled by the medical community. This is why Haiti is poor and the DR is relatively well off. But Vox can't admit this, because to do so would be to admit the farce that is egalitarianism, that not all people are the same, that the race occupying the DR, with their European heritage and 60% white admixture, is just more intelligent and capable, has a better work ethic, and is more able to engage in long-sighted thinking than the race occupying Haiti, a people descended from sub-Saharan Africans. They cannot admit this biological reality, and they certainly cannot admit that nothing Thing. No change in environment and no amount of foreign aid can change this. And so Vox invents a victimhood narrative, a dishonest, slanderous, and indeed libelous one at that. They blame the Dominicans and imply they are a racist, prejudiced, hateful people responsible for Haiti's failures. This is absolutely dishonorable and disgusting. And it is particularly nasty to characterize the Dominicans' protective measures as senseless discrimination or racism. For one, the Dominican Republic, despite being a developing country, still help the Haitians as much as they can. They provided a lot of aid during the earthquake and they allow for their national health budget, paid for by the Dominican taxpayer, to go towards illegal immigrant Haitian mothers giving birth in Dominican hospitals. They are hardly mistreating these people. In fact, they're being bloody generous. But secondly, and more importantly, 
The Dominicans know the Haitians well, and that's why they don't want these people in their country. They do not want the violence and rape and sexually transmitted diseases and superstitious religious practices the Haitians bring with them. They have enough problems of their own and have no need for illiterate, uneducated people who cannot even farm. And they owe these people nothing. The Haitians have repeatedly mounted invasions into Dominican territory, each accompanied by the rape of their women, the killing of their men and their women and their children, the burning of cities, towns and crops. Encroachment into Dominican territory via refusing to control migration from Haiti is another long favored tactic used by the Haitian government. Such migrants have been used to assist attempted invasions in the past. And as if these weren't enough reasons to decide to keep these people out, the Dominicans just do not have enough resources to support Haitian migrants, people who become dependents and are unable to contribute to their economy. The Dominicans are a sovereign people and can choose to do whatever they feel is best for their well-being on their land. They have worked hard to preserve their European roots and identity, and they do not wish to have their culture Africanized by Haitians. They are a free people and can take whatever measures they deem necessary to ensure their safety and the survival of their way of life. They have every right to defend themselves. So shame on Vox and shame Shame on this guy Johnny Harris for trying to guilt trip them into doing otherwise, for lying about them and painting them as intolerant, irrational bigots, for misrepresenting the history of the conflict between these nations to further push your egalitarian propaganda, and for painting the Haitians as victims for your predominantly American audience. I guess you have to prep them for the next big push to take in hundreds of thousands of Haitian migrants because, you know, the DR is so racist and won't help them and we need to take them in. Why do America feel sorry for these people. Your report isn't just inaccurate, it's complete trash. It's dishonorable, it's vile, it's propaganda, and to be honest, I find it utterly disgusting.